Throughout history, the sideshow has been a place where people can go to witness the strange and the unusual, bizarre and the unique. Performers from far off lands are common, but performers from far off planets? Could it be true? In today's episode of Unusual as Usual, we're looking at the struggle of the men from Mars, aka George and Willie Muse. <laughs> The Muse brothers, George and Willie Muse, were born in Roanoke, Virginia, in the 1890s. They were born with a congenital disorder characterized by the complete absence of pigment in the skin, hair and eyes, commonly known as albinism. Although they were both of African American descent, their skin was as white as a ghost, their hair a light golden color and their eyes were a piercing blue. They worked for long hours on the cotton fields from a young age and were brought up by their mother in poverty. Then one day in 1899, while working in the field, they were abducted. George, age six, and Willie, age nine, were kidnapped by bounty hunters hired by a man called James Herman Candy Shelton. Shelton falsely told them their mother had died and that they would never be returning home. He appointed himself as their manager and soon the three of them were touring the US looking for work in every circus and sideshow tent that they found. To accentuate their already unusual appearance, they grew out their hair into long white dreadlocks and in 1922, showman Al G. Barnes began showcasing the brothers in his circus as the white Ecuadorian cannibals, Eco and Ico. But when that failed to attract much attention, the brothers were rebranded as the sheep-headed men. But again, with that failing to attract much of a crowd, their name and gimmick was switched to the ambassadors from Mars. According to their new, most recent backstory, Eco and Ico had been spotted climbing from the wreckage of a spaceship deep in the Mojave Desert. This story captured the imagination of audiences and they soon came flocking from miles around to see these space creatures for themselves. Their banners depicted the brothers standing either side of a globe with the words, are they ambassadors from Mars written above. They were an instant hit, helped no doubt because they stood out from their colleagues of bearded ladies, tattooed men, giants and dwarves. Circus goers were used to seeing black men posing as wild men from distant lands, locked in cages pretending to bite the heads off chickens and gnaw on raw meat. However, Eco and Ico offered something different, if no less racist. They were great musicians, the guitar, banjo, harmonica, saxophone, ukulele, you name it, they could play it. They were also blessed with the amazing gift of being able to remember and recite almost any song, even after hearing it just once. The idea that these so-called Martians would be playing popular tunes in a tent somewhere in the deep south didn't really make any sense, but then again, that didn't seem to really matter. When they took center stage, dressed in their fine red tuxedos and elegant sashes, their explosive white dreadlock hair tied up in a bunch, they were far more interesting than they were grotesque. And their songs filled the tent with a familiar feeling, albeit from an unfamiliar face. And their popularity continued to soar. As well as appointing himself their manager, Shelton also apparently put himself in charge of their money because despite their increasing popularity, Neither George nor Willie saw a penny of their wage while performing under any of these monikers. That popularity led to the Muse Brothers touring with the world famous Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus throughout the majority of the 1920s. They traveled all across America. Then one day in 1927, while performing in their hometown with George on mandolin and Willie on the guitar, Halfway through a rendition of It's a Long Way to Tipperary, a song about missing home, 
one of the brothers noticed someone unusual in the audience. A strangely familiar black woman who had managed to elbow her way to the front of the predominantly white audience. It was their mother. After 13 long years of searching, she had finally found her boys, right back there in her hometown. She threatened to sue Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus and James Shelton. And with that, the Muse Brothers were freed. The brothers did indeed file a lawsuit for 13 years worth of back payment for unpaid wages and initially demanded a lump sum payment of $100,000, but in the end settled for a smaller lump sum and a substantial revision of their contract with a flat monthly wage. This should have been the end of the matter, but over the next few years legal battles continued and the fight to receive the money that they were rightfully entitled to was a constant struggle. Throughout this time, they continued to do what they knew and loved, perform. During their first season back, they played Madison Square Garden and drew over 10,000 spectators during each of their performances. They made spectacular money as their new contract allowed them to sell their own merchandise and keep 100% of the profit. The brothers' albinism helped the Muses to become not just circus attractions, but also case studies for the US eugenics movement. One of their photographs appearing in a textbook called You and Heredity, where the author, Amram Scheinfeld, wrote, they have white skins, pale blue eyes, and flaxen hair. The odd effect produced by combing out the woolly strands and letting them grow for exhibition purposes. They also have oscillating eyeballs, characteristic of many albinos. By sterilization and birth control, we might reduce the population of the unfit, and by stimulating births in other quarters, we might increase somewhat the population of the fit. The state of Virginia, where the brothers came from, was at the forefront of American eugenics. It introduced a program that between 1924 and 1979 forcibly sterilized 8,000 people on the grounds of mental illness, physical deformity, or even homelessness in the name of protecting the purity of the American race. Luckily, the Muse Brothers did not suffer the same fate, and in the 1930s, they left to tour Europe, Asia, and Australia. They performed for royals and dignitaries across the globe, including the soon-to-be Queen of England, Elizabeth II. In 1937, they returned to Ringland Brothers Barnum & Bailey Circus for several years before finally ending their career in 1961 with the Clyde Beatty Circus. The brothers returned to their hometown of Roanoke and lived together in the house they originally purchased for their mother. It was here that George Muse died 10 years later in 1971. Many expected Willie to quickly follow his brother, but those people were wrong. Willie managed to outlive everybody who had exploited him, including the only person he ever truly hated, Shelton, until he passed away in 2001, aged 108 years old. In recent years, they've even had a clever reference made to them in an episode of The Simpsons. The episode is a slightly altered retelling of Todd Browning's cult classic film, Freaks. And who does the camera cut to? None other than Kang and Kudos, two green octopus-like aliens from outer space. More than likely, a very subtle nod to George and Willie Muse. And there we have it, the struggle of the men from Mars, George and Willie Muse. Their music briefly became famous, but today their story has mostly been forgotten. Do you have any musical talents? If so, what are they? Let me know in the comment section below. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe. That's all we've got time for today, but I'll see you all next week. And remember, stay unusual as usual. If you've enjoyed this video, you might like this one too. If you want to see more anatomical oddities, you can check out the full playlist by clicking here.
don't forget to ring that bell to make sure you don't miss out on next week's video and if you have any ideas on what the next episode should be about make sure you add it to the comment section below